at Calvary. And he trod it how? Alone. Is that good news or bad news? That's good news. The reason why he trod it alone is because he didn't want any of us to trot it. So he basically said, hey, I took the wrath of God by myself so that you would not have to sail. Not for sale. Heavenly Father, please speak through me and speak to your people. Lord, help me to take what you have given me and to break bread to share with your people. Draw us close to you as a result is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And that phrase, hard by the palace of Ahab, simply means very close, near to the palace of Ahab. And Ahab was a wicked king of Israel. And the Bible goes into this story of this man named Naboth who has this, this vineyard that it was close to the palace of Ahab, the king of, of Samaria. In verse 2, and Ahab said unto Naboth, saying, or Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. That, that sounds like a good deal. Give me your vineyard, and I will give you a better vineyard, or I will pay for it in cash. The Bible says in verse 3, And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give thee, what? The inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken unto him. For he said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. In other words, it is not for sale. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned his face away and would eat no bread. Verse 5, but, Je but Jezebel, his wife, now you know that name. Jezebel is just not a good name. <laughs> Neither is a good character. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel's wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. How she plans to do that, we will soon see. But I want you to get the story. Ahab sees his vineyard. It is owned by Naboth. And he says to him, give me this vineyard. I'll, I'll pay for it. I'll buy it from you. Or I'll give you another vineyard better than it. I'll give you another vineyard better. I'll give you another one better. Are you with me? And Naboth says, no, I will not. It's my father's inheritance, and God forbid that I give it to you. And when Ahab hears this, he's upset. He's angry. He goes home, and, and, and he, he, he's basically pouting. And his wife looks at him and says, 
what's the matter? And he tells her what happens, and then she says, don't worry about it. You're the king. I will get that vineyard for you. Let's break this down. Why did Naboth refuse to sell his vineyard? I want you to turn with me. Hold your place here. We're going to go to the book of Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus, the 25th chapter. And in Leviticus 25, if you read from verses 1 through 3, or 1 through 22, uh, God there is, is basically telling the children of Israel how he would bless their land and that it would be a fruitful land. This land that was to be flowing with milk and honey. And, and then in verse 23, this is what it says. The land shall not be sold forever. For the land is whose? Mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. God tells them, you're not to sell this land, number one, because it's mine, and number two, because it's going to be a land that is flowing with milk and honey. It's going to be a fruitful land, therefore, I do not want you to sell this land. It is never to be sold. So Naboth was simply obeying the command of, of God. In Numbers 36 verse 7, I'll read it in your hearing. It goes on to say this regarding the land. It says, so shall not the inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe. For every one of the children of Israel shall keep himself to, to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. Verse 9, neither shall the inheritance remove from one tribe to another. But every one of the tribes of the children of Israel shall keep himself to his own inheritance. In other words... They were not to sell the land because it was part of their inheritance. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 7, you will remember that God called Abraham out of the land of Ur. And the Bible actually says, uh, uh, he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. So the land that God gave to Israel was their inheritance. And God was basically saying, do not sell your inheritance. Do not what everyone? sell your inheritance. Your inheritance is not for sale. In Leviticus 26 verse 3 and verse 4, again I'll read it in your hearing. It says, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then will I give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. The yielding of fruit in these vineyards, in this land, was a sign of obedience to God. And therefore, God said, never sell the land because the land is sort of like a, uh, uh, an agreement that you and I have. You obey me, and I'm going to make your land fruitful. You see, beloved, what I want to tell you this morning is that God has given every one of us an inheritance. And your inheritance, say it with me, is not for sale. Never sell it. No matter how good the deal looks, never sell your inheritance. Because God says that this inheritance means I'm going to make you fruitful. In Galatians chapter 5, it tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. God is saying to you, listen, I am giving you these things as an inheritance. When you accept me, when you... for an inheritance. No matter how much uh, uh, the world comes to you and offers you something different. Let me ask you a question. Has the world ever come to you and offered you something better? Hey, hey, you have what? 
hey, listen, I will give you something better in exchange for what you're holding on to now. Do you think Satan wants your inheritance? And do you think that he will do whatever he can to get that inheritance? Beloved, listen to me. Do not sell your inheritance. Don't sell yourself out of your inheritance. No matter what the devil comes to you with, you tell him, not for sale. Do you remember the story of Esau? Do you remember how Esau came uh, in from hunting one day? And the Bible says that Esau was faint. Faint. The word means weary. And he was so faint that, that he was like, I need something to eat and I need to eat it right now. And Jacob, his brother, is like, okay, if you want something to eat, what did he ask? Sell me your birthright. And Esau was like, what good is this birthright going to do me if I'm dead? Here, take the birthright. He had no regard for his birthright, and he sold it for a pot of food. How many of us are like Esau? Selling our birthright for a pot of food. And listen, Esau would, not pro would probably not have done that had he not been weary. Had he not been faint. So you know what the enemy tries to do? <laughs> He tries to get you weary. He tries to wear you out to the point where you don't regard your inheritance anymore. That's what he's after. He's trying to wear you out so that you will give up your inheritance. But Matthew 8 verse 36 tells us this, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Beloved, your birthright should never be on the table for sale. Your inheritance, what God has given you, should never be on the table for sale. Uh, Galatians 6 verse 7 says this, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Remember, this was Naboth's vineyard, a place where he would sow his own fruit and, 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 and reap that fruit. The Bible says here, do not be mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. And then listen to these next words. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we... Esau, I'm faint. You know how we can be dramatic sometimes? <laughs> I pass it out. <laughs> And sometimes we use that, that faintness as an excuse to sell what God has given us. I was faint, that's why I did it. I was weary, that's why I did it. But the Bible says, do not be mocked. You reap what you sow. Therefore, do not be weary. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Honestly, how many of us have ever struggled with being weary? It's a struggle we all face. But God says, listen, don't faint. In fact, in fact, Isaiah 40 verse 31 says this, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God says, wait upon me. Wait upon me. Trust me. Don't grow weary. Don't go faint. And don't sell your inheritance. So, understand that if Satan can't make you weary in order to get you away from your inheritance, then he will straight out persecute you. Come. Come back with me to 1 Kings. And I want you to notice verse 5. 1 Kings... 
Remember, we leave off where Jezebel is like, oh, what? He said, what? Okay, don't worry about it. I got this. And I want you to notice what happens. 1 Kings chapter 5. I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter uh, 21. 1 Kings 21, and let's pick up with verse 7. And Jezebel's wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote, listen carefully, so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. In other words, exalt Naboth before the people. Check this out guys. Verse 10. And set how many? Two men, sons of Belial, that means sons of wickedness, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. They set Naboth up, framed him, and then took him outside the city and stoned him. Verse 11, and the men of the city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants of his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed the fast, set Naboth on high among the people, and there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city, out of the where, everyone? And stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is what? And is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard this, that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. Beloved, listen to me. If Satan cannot get you to sell your birthright, he will straight out persecute you for it. The Bible tells us, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12, Yea, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution. Is this what they did to Naboth? They took him out of his own vineyard, out of his own garden, and stoned him. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Beloved, if Satan cannot wear you out and cause you to faint, he will wear you out through persecution. Daniel 7.25 says that he wears out the saints of the Most High. That means he persecutes. Listen, beloved, don't think it's strange when you are being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Don't think it's strange that when you refuse to yield to the, to the advances of the enemy, that he will not come at you and try to make life so miserable for you that you totally give up. The sad fact, though, is that many of us are really not like Namath at all. We are kind of more like Adam. You remember him? What did Adam do with his inheritance? He sold it. He sold it. It was not his to sell, by the way, was it? Whose was it? It was God's. 
<clears throat> Genesis 1, 26, the Bible says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the earth and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth. So God made man and gave him dominion over the earth. It was his inheritance and he should have kept it. It was not for sale. The Bible actually says in Genesis 2 verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and he put the man whom he had formed there. So God gave Adam and Eve a garden, a vineyard. What did he give them, everyone? A vineyard, a garden. And what did Adam and Eve end up doing? They ended up selling what was not theirs to sell in the first place. They sold their inheritance. But praise God that God did not leave the situation like that. Because the Bible says in Genesis 3.21 that God would send a seed. God would send someone that would come to redeem this earth and that someone was Jesus Christ. And beloved, I want you to get the picture because when Jesus comes on the scene, beloved, he has... Listen... Exodus 19 verse 5, the Bible says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure above me, to me above all the people of the earth, for all the earth is mine. Who does earth belong to? It belongs to God. It is Jesus. He is the one that created this earth. So when he comes to earth, when he is born as a man, what he has done is he has inherited the earth. It's very interesting because the word nameth, the name nameth, it actually means fruit. And, and I want you to understand that the Bible tells us it actually calls Jesus Christ the first fruits. So when Jesus came to this earth, he was coming to, to demonstrate that this world is not Satan's, it is his. This is mine by inheritance. It is interesting to also note that, that, that when Jesus comes upon the scene, you remember that Na Na uh, Naboth was a Jezreelite. He lived in the city of Jezreel. And that city, Jezreel, it, is actually, it actually means God will sow. I need you to catch that. God will sow. What does Namath mean? <laughs> You're making me faint. <laughs> <clears throat> Namath means what? Fruit. Jezreel means God will sow. When Jesus comes to this earth, he comes as the first fruits. When the Bible spoke of Abraham, he said, when God said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. You're going to inherit that land, you and your seed. The Bible tells us that the seed that was being spoken of was Jesus himself. So this was his inheritance. God saying, I'm going to sow in this field, this earth, and the sowing that I'm going to do is going to bring forth a bountiful harvest of fruit. Don't sell the land. Why? Because this land is going to produce much fruit. Let me ask you a question. What is the process of producing fruit? How do you get fruit? What do you have to do? You plant the seed. Something has to be put in the ground. And that thing that is put into the ground comes back out of the ground in a different form. Y'all are not feeling me. <laughs> And so God said, listen, I am pert, I am, this earth is mine because this earth is going to provide a bountiful harvest. There's going to be a lot of fruit coming up out of the ground one day. Amen. 
So, so, remember, in the story, Ahab wants the garden for himself. So he approaches Naboth and says, hey, what will you give me for your garden? Come with me. Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. Because you see, Ahab wanted to make Naboth's garden a part of his own kingdom. Y'all not feeling me. Did you hear what I just said? Ahab wanted to make Naboth's garden a part of his own kingdom. So he goes to him and is basically tempting him to go against the plain word of God. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Verse 1. Please notice what the Bible says here. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says, Then was Jesus led up in the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. And the tempter came to him say, uh, and say, uh, saying, Sell me your inheritance. I know why you are here. You're here to try to win this earth. So listen, let's make a deal. And these three temptations, if you be the son of God, turn this stone to bread. He then takes him to a high place and says, throw yourself down. And, and, and if you're God, or if you're the son of God, your father will save you. And then he finally says, look, all this will I give you. Hold on, hold on. Look, hold on. Look. Come down with me. Verse, verse 7. Or verse, verse uh, 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into the, an exceeding high mountain and showed him how much? All. all, listen, I know why you're here. If I exchange for you all the kingdoms of the world, will you give me the field? Will you sell me your inheritance? And Jesus basically, if we were to sum it up, Jesus basically replied, not for sale. Why? Why am I not willing to sell? Because of the fruit that's going to come forth from this land. Jesus was unwilling to sell because of you. Now, how does that make you feel? <laughs> does that make you feel special? Not for sale. I'm not giving up this land. But what's so, look at the land. It's crazy. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's full of sin. And Jesus says, no, this land, there's going to be a bountiful harvest coming from this land. And I will not sell it. You can't have them. Psalm 94 verse 14, the Bible says, For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. Romans 8.35 should have a special meaning to you now. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? In other words, Jesus was willing to go through all this to keep the land. Because of you. My people are precious to me and I will not sell this land for anything. That's how precious this land is to Jesus. That's how precious you are to Jesus. So get the story now. Ahab, I mean Satan, is like, you won't sell it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> The Bible says the devil goes away, leaving, leaving Jesus after these temptations. Devil realizes, I'm not going to get it from him through bribery. 
I'm not going to get it from him through, through him being faint or weary. Because by the way, was Jesus weary in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights? And even in his weariness, he was like, not for sale. Not selling it. All right, so if I can't buy it from you, then we need to set you up. So, so watch this. What happens? Come with me to Matthew chapter 26. You need to see this. Matthew chapter 26. Note what happens. Matthew 26. Verse 3. Matthew 26 verse 3. The Bible says these words. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes. And the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who's, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus subtly and what? Let me ask you a question. What did Jezebel, what was Jezebel's plan to get the land? Kill Naboth. Do you see here a parallel? <laughs> Do you see here Satan going, okay, I can't. I can't get him to, to sell it to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill him. And, and if you check out the rest of the story, it's really quite interesting because if you jump down with me a, a, a few verses, uh, actually down to verse 46. Verse 46, just notice what the Bible says here. Matthew 26 and verse 46. Are you there? Now, I'm sorry, verse 46. The Bible says, rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came with him, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. And now he, now he that betrayed him gave him a sign, saying, whomsoever I shall kiss, the same is he, hold him fast. And if you continue reading on, the Bible tells us, verse 60, I believe it is, verse 57. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off uh, onto the high priest's office and went in and sat uh, with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the councils sought false what? Witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. And at the last came how many? Do you remember that number? Two false witnesses come against Naboth to, Naboth to say, yeah, um, you are guilty of blasphemy. Let me ask you a question. What did they accuse Jesus of being guilty of? Blasphemy. Claiming to be God and blasphemy. And so what did they do? Where did they crucify him? Do you catch this? They crucified him outside the city. Did they set him on high? Jesus said, and I, if I be what? Lifted up will do what? Draw all men unto me. Now listen to me. You got to understand this. You see, when Ahab did this, he thought that he had secured his kingdom. He had secured his vineyard, I should say. But little does Ahab realize that in this very act, in killing Naboth, watch this. Come back with me to 1 Kings chapter 21. You need to see this. 1 Kings 21 verse 16. 1 Kings chapter 21. Notice what happens here. 1 Kings 21 verse 16. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of of it. Can you imagine Ahab like all happy 
like, yeah, this is mine now. Everything is good to go. He is out of the way, and this is all me. But you got to understand something. Because this was the very thing that led to Ahab's death. Listen to me. Look at the next verse. The Bible says in verse, uh, verse, 16, verse 17, And the word of the Lord came to Elisha, Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth. Whither he has gone down to what? To possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. Do you catch what's happening here? The very act of Ahab putting to death Naboth secured his own destruction. Okay, y'all not feeling me. <laughs> the very act in Naboth thinking, this is how I'm going to get victory. I'm going to put, I'm sorry, in Ahab thinking, this is how I'm going to get victory. I'm going to put him to death so that I can get his field. In that very act, his own death and defeat were secured. Beloved, listen to me. In the very act of Satan seeking to destroy the life of Christ, in the very act of Satan trying to bruise the heel of Jesus, in that very act, he secured his own destruction. Do you remember how Jesus said, except a kernel of wheat uh, 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 die and is buried, it abides alone. But if it die and is buried, then it will what? Bring forth much fruit? Listen, guys. Do you realize, you need to see, come, come back with me. Come back with me to uh, uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 19. Luke chapter 13, verse 19. Let's see if we can get it up on the screen. And then we're going to go to John 18, verse 1. Luke chapter 13, verse 19. It is like a grain of a mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his what? Talking about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is giving this analogy, and he says, It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew and waxed a great tree, and all the fowls of the air lodged their branch in it. Beloved, Jesus Christ is that seed that was planted in the garden of the Lord. The very planting of that seed secured the destruction of Satan. In fact, do you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Oh, I just gave it away. Man. <laughs> the Garden of Gethsemane. It was as if while he was in that garden, God was reminding him, listen, he was struggling with this sacrifice. And God was saying, it was like he was being reminded, you have come here to redeem the garden. You have come here because there is going to be a bountiful harvest. Don't turn back now. He saw your face in the garden of Gethsemane. And said, no, I will not sell it. I will not walk away from this. And in fact, when Jesus died, John 19 verse 41. When Jesus died, remember, where did they take Jesus from? Where did they find him? In the garden. They tried to take Jesus from the garden. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus died, John 19 verse 41. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a... And in the garden, a new what? Where never man had... So where was Jesus buried? Where was Jesus planted? And the fact that he was planted in a garden signified that he would be the first fruit to come forth from the ground to pave the way 
for other fruits to come from the ground. Now check this out, guys. The Bible tells us that in the same place that that, uh, Naboth died would be the same place that Ahab would die. Did you catch that just now? God said to, to, to Elijah, tell Ahab that in the same place, and this is powerful, you gotta see this, in the same place. So the question is, where did Jesus die? You all know the answer, right? He died where? He died at Calvary. But where was Calvary? Outside You guys, Jesus died outside the city. Does the Bible tell us that in the same place that Jesus died, does the Bible tell us that Satan will die in that same place? It does, doesn't it? Now, know what you're saying. Wait a minute. Where in the world does the Bible say that Satan will die where Jesus died? Listen, guys. Come. <laughs> no, no, no. I got to finish. <laughs> How do I do this? I don't know. Look, look. Isaiah 6. Let me read in your hearing, okay? Follow me closely. Isaiah 63, verse 3. Speaking prophetically of Jesus, it says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. Where did Jesus trod the winepress of God's wrath? At Calvary. And he trod it how? Alone. Is that good news or bad news? That's good news. The reason why he trod it alone is because he didn't want any of us to trod it. So he basically said, hey, I took the wrath of God by myself so that you would not have to. I died on Calvary so that you would not have to. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Christ became the curse for us, and he became the curse for us outside the city. Psalm 75 verse 8, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out the same, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. Christ drank that cup for us in the garden of Gethsemane and on the cross, and he did it all himself, so that you and I would not have to experience that. He took it upon himself. Remember, he prayed, if it be possible, let this what? Let this cup pass from me. The Bible says that he took our sins upon himself. And now listen carefully, beloved, because this is, this is the main point I want to get across to you now. So please follow carefully. Hebrews 2, 12 verse 2 says this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What does it mean, despising the shame? What do you think despising the shame meant? Did did Jesus experience shame on our behalf? Where did he experience that shame? At the cross. The cross is the place of shame. What I say? It's the place of shame. It's the place of reproach. Outside the city, Christ took our shame upon himself. Now watch this. Hebrews 13, 11 tells us this. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he, might be, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. And then it says this, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. God is inviting us now, go outside the city, when? Now, to bear what? His reproach. Listen to me, guys. He's inviting you to do it when? Now. When is he inviting you to do it? 
now because you don't want to be there later. <laughs> Did you catch what I just said? If you don't, just follow along. God is inviting us now. Hey, symbolically, go outside the city now. Go to that place where, where it's shame now. Go there now. Experience it now. Let us bear the reproach of being a Christian now. You see, beloved, the world is trying to rob you of your inheritance through shame. You're a what? <laughs> you really believe in that Bible? Do you, do you see what I'm talking about? The world's weapon to try to get you to sell your inheritance is shame. So Jesus says, listen, don't be ashamed of me. Bear the shame. Bear the reproach. Do it now. Be willing to be ashamed for my cause. Like Paul said, I am not ashamed. Bear the shame, but don't be ashamed. <laughs> Bear the shame. Be willing to stand up and say, yeah, that's who I am. This is what I believe. Bear the shame, but don't be ashamed. And there's a very simple reason why, beloved. L listen, do you remember the book of uh, Hebrews 11, uh, chapter two, verse 24, rather? It says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called Pharaoh's son, or Pharaoh's, uh, be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. What did Moses do? He preferred the reproach of Christ than the riches of Ahab. The riches of Egypt. The riches of this world. At the end of time, we're told in Joel chapter 3, In fact, come there with me. Joel chapter 3. Let's get it up on the screen. Joel chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. Joel chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. The Bible says, Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Verse 13. Put ye in the sickle for the harvest of what everyone? The harvest is ripe. Come get you down for the press is full. The fats overflow for the wickedness is great. God says at the end of time, there's going to be a great slaughter in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Anyone know where the valley of Jehoshaphat is? What, what event is this talking about? Anyone know? This is talking about the final judgment. The valley of Jehoshaphat. The, 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 there's going to be a great slaughter. And check this out. The Bible tells us in Zechariah 13 that when Jesus comes again, his feet are going to stand upon the mount of what? Olives. And what is going to be descending down from heaven as Jesus comes down to the earth? It's going to be the place called the new Jerusalem. And beloved, listen to me. At that time, the people who are outside the city are the ones who were ashamed of Jesus Christ. The ones who refused to go out to where Jesus was, bearing the shame, bearing the cross. The ones who, ref the ones who were easily led, the ones who sold their birthright. The ones who said, I don't want a part of this land. I don't want a part of this inheritance. At the end of time, guess where they end up? The same place that Jesus died. For them. That's the crazy thing. Jesus said, I'm going to die outside the city for you so that you don't have to die outside the city. And yet, because they refused the reproach of Jesus, here the wicked stand outside 
the city. What a waste of the sacrifice of Jesus. We're closing. I need you to listen to these verses. Mark 8, verse 36, Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? And the very next verse says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. As Susan comes up, I want to let you know something. Outside the city, there are three places of significance. Outside the city of Jerusalem in the days of Jesus, there were three places of significance. One was Calvary. It was outside the city. Two was Gethsemane. It was outside the city. And both of those places were what? gardens number three the other significant place outside the city was a place called Gehenna you know what that is it's the place where bodies were burned and beloved I want you to understand that when Jesus and that new Jerusalem touches this earth at the very end of this world's history, the people outside the city will remember something very specific. They will remember the one who died outside the city for them. They will remember the cup he drank on their behalf, and they will lament the fact that as they are being destroyed, they will lament the fact that they rejected what happened outside the city for them. And beloved, my appeal to you today is this. It's time for us to go out of the city now. It's time for us to bear the reproach and the shame of Christ now. We love him because he first loved us. He died for a world that rejected him, that put him out of the city. That's who he died for. He didn't die for the righteous. Because if he died for the righteous, not one of us would be saved. He died for the wicked. He died to redeem those who were his enemies. And he's pleading now, accept my sacrifice on your behalf. And beloved, my simple appeal is if, you, if you're saying to yourself today, Lord, make me willing to bear the shame and the reproach. Help me to not be so quick to sell my inheritance. That's your desire. I want you to raise your hand as Susan comes up. She's going to lead us in prayer. Lord, let me have that mentality that my inheritance is not for sale. If you can, please kneel as Susan prays.